Good morning. Uh, Mark Skinner with the Aerospace Corporation, uh, Senior Program Leader for Space Traffic Management. I have the honor of, uh, of hosting the Government Roundtable today at this uh, August Forum. Um, Every, all the panelists are going to introduce themselves uh, and then give their opening remarks, and then we'll open the floor for questions and discussions. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, Dr. Diane Howard at the Department of Commerce. Go ahead, Diane. The floor is yours. And you're probably so sick of me by now, but I'm happy to report to everybody on the panel, the attendees, this is the last you're going to hear from me until the end of tomorrow. So um, I... Um, I'm actually, you all know that I work at the Office of Space Commerce. I'm, I'm uh, the attorney for the office, but I'm also part of the uh, SPD3 SSA STM implementation team. And um, last year, when I spoke on this panel at this conference, I talked a little bit about, um, you know, the things that we were hoping to do. And, and, and my, basically, my, my plea was, please give us money. <laughs> and then, and I, my, my promise, my pledge, my commitment to the community was that we were going to do everything we could um, with what we had. And so I thought today I would just kind of give you a brief update from then to now, because a lot has happened. And we did do a lot, and we are still doing a lot. Um, so the first thing that I talked about last year was about uh, the fact that Congress had mandated us to uh, fund a study uh, by the National Academy of Public Administration to basically uh, research, investigate um, the, uh, all of the different issues uh, that are contained within space traffic management. And the uh, results of that study, after they interviewed many more than 100 people, um, many of whom are participants in this particular event right now, um, was that they felt that we were the best suited uh, to perform the STM tasks and within the federal government, the US federal government, and that uh, they um, saw that the things that we're talking about when we talk about space traffic management are really data management functions more than telling people where to go and what to do at this particular junction. So um, that was really very validating. And um, I think we gained a lot of insight um, reading through the NAPA study. It, it helped us um, in, in working with them and, and answering their questions um, and then reading what their uh, conclusions were. It really helped us crystallize what, a lot of what we needed to do. So the next big thing that came after that was we did um, an industry day that uh, took place across two days. Again, many people in this event and in this community um, participated both in the industry days and then also um, on some of the one-on-ones that we had uh, after the fact, which went on for like months, but, but they were wonderful and we learned a great deal. So we had like 250 people over the course of the two industry day uh, events and then we had, uh, you know, tens, I'm like dozens of people that came for the one-on-ones. And we, again, have learned a great deal. And the thing that happened right on the heels of that was that we finally, um, our plea was answered. So we, we got some funding, um, not all that we had asked for, but we got some funding. And we also got some, some um, very direct taskings in the congressional language. And so uh, the three things that we um, were tasked with um, basically told how to spend this money uh, are to stand up the initial OADR. And so anybody who's heard, I mean, you've all heard me speak, you've heard Kevin speak, um, and my, my colleague Mark Mulholland is, is a, an attendee, you've heard him speak, Mark Daly, and we've all talked about our, our initial foray into the OADR through the Big Data Project of NOAA, but we, we are now in the process of, of um, building out our OADR uh, more fully and so that, that's one of the things that we are told we must do. Um, also to develop some technical capabilities. And the one that I love the most, and that is to um, put together some demonstrations, which I think is really where the goodness lies is in these demonstrations. And so right now that's what we're working on in, in, in figuring this out. Another thing that um, occurred in this congressional language is we were merged, or we were told to merge our office with another office in the Department of Commerce and within NOAA, and that is the Commercial Remote Sensing uh, Regulatory Affairs Office. And so we are right now in the process of working with our leadership to figure out what you know, personnel uh, changes we need to make and how, how best to accommodate this. We've been working closely with them, um, most notably in, in the uh, rulemaking that they uh, 
published and, and finalized last spring, but there's a great synergy between our offices. And so this is a wonderful opportunity for us to go forward with that. And I think that brings you up to date between Kevin's keynote and, and the, the you know cliff notes I just gave you on what we're doing, I will yield to my next panelist. Thank you. Well, thank you, Diane. Um, let's now hear from uh, Steph Earl at the FAA um, Office of Commercial Space Transportation. Steph, uh, over to you. Sure, well, like most people, I'm, this is Steph Earl, not in the FAA, but from the FAA. So unless the FAA has all of my spare bedroom in here. So, but thank you for inviting me for this conference. This is one of those wonderful conferences where when I look at the list and I see the questions, it reminds me that this isn't the conference that somebody's gonna ask us how we power something on the dark side of the moon or um, you know, if geostationary objects, why is there a risk if they're not moving? The, this is a space conference. So I always appreciate coming to it when it was Embry-Riddle or at UT. This is one of my favorite conferences to come to. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the FAA, who we are, why we do what we're doing, and then uh, where we're engaging in these areas. So the Office of Commercial Space Transportation at the FAA, who we are, we license launch operations, reentry operations and spaceports. But it's important to note that we, we don't work for the companies that we license. We work for the public. And that's what our job is, is public safety. That's the number one reason why we exist. Uh, the mission of the Department of Transportation is, is safety and efficiency. I mean, we build, we ensure the nation has the safest and most modern infrastructure for efficiency. Uh, so, so that fits with what we do. And it also kind of fits with how we work with uh, the safety of launch operations and into space. Um, and so what do we do specifically with the, the ideas of space truck management? Since we license launch and reentry for us, it's really about launch collision avoidance, you know, merging into orbit safely. Uh, and it's about orbital debris mitigation. And so those are the, the really the areas of focus that we have in this area that we are working on. And we've been updating a lot of information that we have. So we have updated our launch collision avoidance rules <clears throat> and those were published in the streamlining regulation 450 that's uh, going to become effective. You know, we're still working on that, but the important thing to note is the, the launch collision avoidance requirements are so important that they're, they're, not, they're not even delayed. There's no, they are, once the rule is implemented, those will become in effect. And they kind of match what we have done with um, at federal ranges and federal range policy. So we work with NASA, uh, the Department of Defense and, and ourselves and kind of a tri spaceport organization to make sure that we synergize our rules so that they apply. So launch collision avoidance is definitely a big, a big area for us. Uh, orbital debris mitigation, another huge area. So together with the interagency and most of the people that are on the screens, we, we updated the orbital debris mitigation standard practices in 2019. And then we at the FAA are working on taking those and turning them, the appropriate ones into regulation orbital debris mitigation standard practices for the United States government. They're not self-executing on commercial operations. It requires the regulator to actually create a regulation, put it out for public comment, look at the cost evaluation, and then implement it. So that's what the FAA is doing with orbital debris mitigation. A lot of work to do there because as we know, <clears throat> orbital debris mitigation, it, it is changing dramatically lately. Um, you might say radically changing the way things are going. Um, so let me answer a couple of questions that I saw. One that isn't in this side, but it came from the last one where that somebody said, is a launch from a high altitude balloon covered by the same regulations as a launch from the ground? And the answer to that is yes. If you're doing a launch anywhere in the world, doesn't matter what technique, you, you still have to apply the same regulations. Now, those regulations would be tailored or tweaked um, to the appropriateness of that vehicle, but it's basically the same uh, regulations and the same purpose, you know, public safety and safety of property. Um, and so you would have the same rules. So someone asked that question. And then Mark's big question about space traffic reports and is there some way to use these? And I'm gonna give a shout out to Mariba's astrograph because it's all, this been one of my 
kind of ideas that we do have a way of providing conjunctions and we know we, the government, provide a lot of conjunctions to operators, but we don't do as much in the follow-up on those. And I think Astrograph was a great way of looking at those real time or close to near real time and then assessing the conjunctions that we provided earlier. Um, because today what we work on is a conjunction comes forward and it either over time gets more concerning or less concerning and then we just throw it away. Um, but rarely do I see anything after the fact, unless of course we're talking about the you know 50-50 chance that you're gonna blow up over Pittsburgh. Um, and then it gets the media because then everyone thinks that debris is gonna fall on Pittsburgh, um, which we, we know is not correct. But we could probably do a better job of integrating and looking at the processes that we're doing. So, but I'll save the rest. I've got, I can talk all day uh, like most of us. So I'll save the rest for the question and answer. Well, thank you, Steph. Uh, that was interesting. Um, yes, there'll be some questions. Um, our next next up is Ryan uh, Guglietto from the State Department. Uh, please introduce yourself, Ryan, and welcome. Thanks very much. Uh, happy to be here. My name is Ryan Guglietta. I'm a Foreign Affairs Officer in the uh, Office of Space Affairs at the Department of State. Um, we wear kind of a lot of hats in the office in general, but one of the things that, that I lead on is um, the UN process for registration filings. Um, it's both a labor of love and frustration, depending. Um, but I kind of just want to start off by giving a brief background kind of on the registration aspects. And um, let me just share my screen real quick, assuming I can do that. One second. Share. Okay, do you all see a PDF that says improving the timeliness? Looking for nods. Yes, okay, great. Uh, so I'll just start. Um, so in, uh, the Convention of Registration of Space Ob launched into outer space, more commonly known as the Registration Convention, is one of the core international treaties governing space activity. In the 45 years since its entry into force, the Registration Convention has been recognized as a key element of the international foundation for advancing transparency and confidence building measures to encourage responsible actions in and the peaceful use of outer space. The importance of space object registration was first highlighted in 1959, when the first session of the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, or COPUIS, noted that, quote, precise orbital elements are determined by launching countries from data acquired during the launching and initial orbital phases. In addition to scientific and technical usefulness, information concerning precise orbital elements might assist in identifying individual satellites. The problem of identification will become increasingly difficult as satellite traffic overloads the ground facilities. It will therefore probably be useful for orbital elements to be registered at a central point, which proved to be true. So in December 1961, the recommendation resulted in the adoption of UN General Assembly Resolution 1721B, which required that the UN Secretary establish a public registry of objects launched into orbit or beyond. Speaking in support of the resolution, US Ambassador Adelaide Stevenson noted that it would help all countries to take part in space activities and would foster mutual trust and confidence. So as a result of this resolution, the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs has maintained a register of objects launched into outer space since 1962. Over the subsequent decade, the UN register became a means of identifying which states bear international responsibility and potential liability for space objects as copious in accordance with the 1967 Outer Space Treaty and the 1972 Liability Convention. The international framework for space object registration was further defined in 1974 when copious completed negotiations on a registration convention. Countries which are party to the registration convention make treaty commitments to establish their national domestic registries of space objects, and parties also agree to provide specific information on their space objects in the UN Secretary General for inclusion and the United Nations registry as soon as practicable. The US is one of the original parties to the registration convention, which currently has 69 parties. So further international guidance on compliance of the registration provision was, uh, was put forth in the UN General Assembly resolution adopted in December of 2007, based on text negotiated at COPUIS, a non-legally binding resolution, uh, recommendations on enhancing the practice of states and international intergovernmental organizations and registering space objects, provides more specific guidance to standardize submissions to the UN register. The resolution also provides guidance to help national governments sort out which launching state has responsibility for registering a satellite 
from one nation territory, but controlled from another. An example of this would be a US commercial remote sensing satellite launched from New Zealand, which is certainly something that does happen. So following this resolution, the recently adopted UN long-term sustainability guidelines underscores the need for enhancing the practice of registering space objects and guideline A5 specifically, which requests that states adopt appropriate national or other relevant policies and regulations to harmonize and sustain registration practices. In the 13 years since this resolution was adopted, the United States has made extensive efforts to work with other launching states to coordinate space object registration for launching on US launch vehicles. The importance of this work has increased in recent years with the advent of large cluster launches containing dozens of micro and nano satellites. So while the US has constantly shared its public satellite catalog through its space situational awareness efforts, US practice has been less timely and consistent with respect to making registration convention space object filings with the UN Secretary General. One factor is the lack of documented internal US government processes for compiling the data required for filing. As a result, the timeliness uh, and frequency of US filings declined substantially after 2012. So now you all can see here, so this is just a graph of that. Essentially, each point is when a US registration filing uh, occurred. And then you can see on the other axis, that's days from the earliest launch to one that was actually filed. And you can see there's quite a range and it can be quite substantial. Uh, so to ensure a more consistent process, the US National Space Traffic Management Policy issued in uh, June 2018 directed the Department of State to lead efforts to streamline the US government's interagency process to ensure accurate and timely space object registration submissions pursuant to the registration convention. This streamlined process was completed in early 2019 and fully implemented across the US government in early 2020. As a result, the frequency and timeliness of US registration filings significantly improved in the second half of 2020, which you can see here. So again, you know, you can see that we've, we're down quite a bit and also the number of filings has decreased, which I'll show in a second too. Uh, so looking ahead, uh, state plans to continue working closely with its partners at the Federal Aviation Administration, the Department of Defense, NASA, and NOAA to ensure that recent improvements and the timeliness of filings uh, to the UN is sustained. State is also working with the Department of Commerce to ensure the domestic US space object registry will be accessible via the OADR. Uh, this should allow all users of the OADR to access US registration convention filings as soon as they are submitted to the United Nations. So they'll come out faster. Uh, this will also allow for registration data to be synthesized with other data sets hosted in OADR. In conclusion, it is worth noting that the United States recognizes that transparency and data sharing are essential to safe, stable, and sustainable space operations. By making progress in improving the timeliness and consistency of our registration filings, the United States is acting responsibly by providing US satellite information with openness and transparency and is assuring leadership role in advancing other forms of international cooperation for spaceflight safety, stability, security, and long-term sustainability for the benefit of all. Thank you, and I know that was a little lengthy. Well, thank you, Ryan. Uh, that was quite interesting. There will be questions. Um, uh, I guess we've got Jeff Braxton uh, as the final uh, set of uh, introductory remarks. Jeff, over to you. Jeff, you're muted. How about now? Am I good? Got it. Thanks. Well, um, thanks a lot. Uh, it's always an honor to be with this crowd. Um, it, you know, most of you know me. Uh, I'm a 96 grad of the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. Um, in my copious amount of spare time, I have an academic hat that I wear out here as a strategic leadership fellow affiliated with the University of Nebraska's Strategic Research Institute. Um, I work at Space Command Headquarters in the Strategy Plans Policy Directorate of the Strategic Engagement Division, um, mainly working uh, engagement within the U.S. Department of Defense, so we call that intra-departmental, as well as with the broader U.S. agency and um, where appropriate with our allies and other partners. Prior to coming out here, um, I performed uh, chief analyst duties out at then the Joint Space Operations Center, now the Combined Space Operations Center in California. And I'll tell you, we got a foot of snow out here over the past uh, 36 hours. So I wonder if I should go back to California. But uh, all kidding aside, uh, my military experience um, uh, aligned uh, with the space launch and range operations where I got to meet Steph the first time and uh, intercontinental ballistic missile operations and flight testing for the same. I, I don't have really a whole heck of a lot to, to share with you guys, but over the past year, 
you know, in, in the spirit of what Diane did is kind of an update. Um, you know, what is, I, I keep seeing, and it's because we, we, we don't do a good enough job of clarifying it, so hopefully this will help. What is the difference between U.S. Space Command and the U.S. Space Force? There very much is a difference. Uh, my organization, U.S. Space Command, uh, we're, we, we execute, um, uh, our job one for us is uh, to, to do deterrence-focused, multinational, multi-service warfighting operations. Um, again, I want to emphasize deterrence focus, but also underscore that the, um, sorry, my phone, my other phone's going off here. So I'm going to put that in the drawer. Um, but I also want to, want to emphasize, um, the multinational and multi-service approach. Um, our aim is to provide credible warfighting capability and capacity to deter first and foremost, um, uh, bad actors, bad behavior, um, hostile aggression in space, as well as to defend interests uh, for not only the U.S. but for its allies and other partners alike. Uh, one of the other the other parts uh, that are of the U.S. Space Command overall mission is to deliver space effects to the combined force, uh, a multinational, multi-partner force, and then that those effects are delivered not only within space but across and within all the other um, domains. And then finally, uh, but perhaps most importantly, um, we look to develop second to none space oriented warfighters for the same, for that combined force. So that's US Space Command in a nutshell. Space Force is an organized, trained, and equipped uh, service, not a joint command or a combined command. Um, and they, they provide the lion's share of US space oriented warfighters. A warfighter is a warfighter is a warfighter, but we have Certain, you know, we have uh, maritime warfighters, we have air warfighters. So, U.S. Space Force provides the lion's share of, of space-oriented warfighters to the combined force. And uh, of just kind of a note there, um, I don't know if you saw it or not recently, but uh, Vice President Pence, when when he was the vice president, so I uh, I would say former Vice President Pence uh, announced that. Um, Folks in the U.S. Space Force uh, are no longer airmen, but they are guardians, and I think that's a good, good um, a name to to give them because that's really what it's about is guardians. Um, so really, you know, what the space, what U.S. Space Command and the U.S. Space Force are looking to do is to do our part in making space stable, safe, secure. That's really our biggest piece and ultimately sustainable. So I look forward to questions to come. Thanks. Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, interesting introduction there. Um, so I think the first question will go to Ryan, who's new to this forum. Uh, we haven't seen you here before in, uh, when, in the before times when we were actually in person. Uh, and I, I had a question and Victoria also asked a very leading question that's uh, very similar. So uh, we've got a lot of a lot of launching going on and uh, a lot of objects are getting launched. Uh, we had a SpaceX launch the other day with uh, I think 104 different satellites. Uh, SpaceX has been uh, launching copious numbers of uh, Starlink satellites. Um, and also we've had the problem that we discussed, uh, many of us on this panel discussed just a couple weeks ago about how when CubeSats get launched, a lot of times they go unidentified uh, I imagine this causes problems for the registration of space objects. Uh, how is state um, handling this? So is there going to be an automated process? Uh, is there a way to help identify things? Uh, Ryan, please, uh, please help us out here. Sure. So, I mean, it's a very good question in terms of just the volume of objects launched lately is you know, so much higher than it was even 10 years ago. And you know, right now our process is rather manual. You know, we get launch reports and then in our office compiles those and then submits those to the UN uh, Office of Outer Space Affairs. So when we get, you know, 120 Starlinks launched, that's a lot of data entry to do. That's a lot of kind of figuring out. One of the nicer things about these mega constellations is part of our job that takes the longest amount of time is ensuring that the proper state registers the proper object, or in this case, that the US registers what it should be registering and not something that another state party is, is responsible for. 
So often with the Starlinks and SpaceX, it's very easy to understand like, okay, these should be registered by the United States. So it may be 120 objects, but it's easier because there's a lot less legwork and really discerning who the proper state of registration is. So from that perspective, it's not that bad, but there is a significant number of volume. And as you said, you know, the tracking of these objects can be somewhat tricky, but that's more on you know, other agency side. And I'm not sure if anyone else would want to comment on that as well. Sure, I'll, um, I'll jump in. So, uh, so registration is a result of launch. And so it's the uh, FAA's licensing requirements that um, make sure that the operators of the launch operations provide the information to us, which we provide to the State Department. And, uh, and, and Ryan's right. It, it is definitely difficult when we have these large constellations that are la launched because we're not cataloging them and cataloging them accurately is something that we need to have so that they have the right international designation number, which we can give to state, which they can then use. And so what we see on some of these SpaceX is not as difficult because of the, the method that they deploy allows us, and we've, we've had some experience. I think we have some, we're pretty good at identifying individual Starlinks based upon the way they're deployed. But when you get to either a shotgun or a cluster uh, deployment that, that doesn't follow the same methodology, random deployments, then what we get are a lot of missed tags. And sometimes those can be, a real pain when an object is identified for another country. And so we give them the information that this is your international designation number. And then two months later, it changes. And, and this complicates the UN registration a lot when we have to go back and look at the small sats that and, and determine which way they've been registered and have they swapped. And so it's, it's definitely a challenge. And it's also a challenge when you have DOAs. So the, the Starlink one, we haven't seen this from, from the US launches, but we have seen this from foreign launchers where they launch a slew of objects and 10 of them are, nine of them are DOA. Three of the DOAs are US, which ones? We don't know. And so that also complicates uh, the registration process when you can't identify a payload because it's dead it, no one knows which one it is. Three are some country, three are another's and so, uh, it, there are a lot of difficulties that we are having with these multiple payloads and we're still working through them. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna follow up a little bit. I, 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 from hearing what you and Ryan are saying, um, and just from our general experience, space in the US is distributed throughout the government. There's no one agency that does it all. Uh, we've got DOD, we've got national security space, we've got civil launches, we've got commercial launches. We've got oversight of US citizens launching in foreign countries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it seems to me that, that the current registration process is pretty manual as far as I know from what I've heard from, uh, it's maybe an Excel spreadsheet that gets, gets uh, emailed around. Is there, is there any talk about uh, maybe automating this and somehow uh, getting something that works a little bit better so that it's a little bit more efficient and accurate? Uh, I'll start with you, Steph, and then we'll, let Ryan and whoever else wants to throw in on that. All right, so you, you found me out. It is an Excel spreadsheet, um, but we are actually talking about making an access database, if that's the, and so, uh, but it, it is a hard thing to do. And the reason is, I think we've tried to automate it like three or four times. Um, and there's always an exception that gets through. So Cygnus is an example. Cygnus launches, goes to the International Space Station, hangs out with the astronauts for about two months and then departs and then releases additional satellites, you know, three or four months after its initial launch. And the way we have designated a parent-child relationship is the launch date for that is the launch date of the Cygnus. And so, so there's always this exception. But it is something that I think we in the interagency are working with state as well as uh, commerce to see is there something we can do that improves this. So in the FAA, we have um, with an aircraft registry, you can go to that registry, you can just type in a number and tail number and poof, there's the information you have. Uh, that level of information that I believe commerce is trying to put in the OADR might help a little bit, but the actual process of gathering this information is pretty, um, it, it's, it's manually intensive. Uh, it's definitely manual intensive. Diane? 
Yeah, and if I could just throw in on that, I, some things have already improved. So if I'm not mistaken, there was a time when something that deployed from the ISS was given the launch date as when the ISS was first uh, put into orbit. So it's gotten better and there's room for it to improve even further. And, and one of the great takeaways from the aerospace CubeSat confusion event a few weeks ago was there was a lot of discussion, not just about trackability, but also about identification, which, so we do have technologies, they're not mandatory, not now, um, but maybe these are, this is why incentivizing is such a, a, a wonderful thing to include in the title of this event, because there are technologies that are available to help some of this matrix. And I know that uh, Mariba's team at, at UT is doing some work with uh, registration convention and compliance. Um, these are, this is why we want to uh, include the registration information in the OADR and make it usable, make it so that it's searchable. So it's not just, uh, you know, so it's an Excel spreadsheet that's not PDF'd, but instead something that you can utilize. So I, I do think that there's been improvement. Um, it's a, a Herculean task because the technologies are pushing things. And I remember that we had an interagency phone call at some point in the last two years, Steph, where we were talking about the ISS problem and, and that's been addressed. And so I, 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 the eternal optimist, see a lot of, uh, a lot of potential here. And Ryan, any, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, just to jump in on that too, you know, I definitely agree with Diane in that the process is improving. And specifically with that issue, you're right. You know, the international designators are 1998 is how it starts because that is when the ISS went up. And, you know, the date of launch was also listed as that. So, you know, this was solved by simply adding a deployed date on the registration file. So I think one thing that really helped was SPD3 because it really motivated a lot more interagency coordination. You know, you had all these siloed issues that people weren't necessarily talking about in a group setting. And now, you have that, you know, we have these interagency meetings, we have an SOP, we talk about these issues a lot. And I think that that has definitely helped modernize the system. I use the term modernize a little loosely because we are still working with Excel files. Um, and even just in terms of how we communicate with the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs, we're really trying to improve. I mean, silly things like, you know, we used to include when we had the common name for an object, we would have it in all caps because that was the nomenclature we would see a lot. And then when we actually opened a dialogue with UNUSA, they're like, hey, that actually slows down our translators when they're like importing the data and things like that. So even small changes like that can speed up the process a little bit. So right now we're really in the space of trying to make things as efficient as possible. And, and you could see in the second chart that I showed that, you know, before where our filings were, we would send maybe four or five or six months worth at a time. We're really trying to get that down to just one month filing at a time that speeds up UNUSA's processing of it. It speeds their posting of it. And you know, hopefully, it just speeds the whole process along. So there are definitely there's definitely room for improvement, but I think we're heading in the right direction. Okay, thank you. Um, I see that Jeff has turned his camera off. Jeff, you can hide, but you can't run when you're on Zoom here. Uh, my next question is going to be for Jeff, with some help from Diane on this. Um, so we recognize that Department of Commerce uh, SBD three has stuffed a lot of stuff into their job jar uh, that the uh, that the, you guys used to do, or you guys would, would were handling, um, and and so they're starting off with eleven million dollars and uh, no sensor network. Um, you guys have uh, a very uh, robust sensor network. Um, I imagine that the taxpayer would would like it if the commerce could could one you know get information that they need from commercial companies, but they also I think are going to need to rely on information that you guys have been collecting. Um, in form of observations and things like that, not just what you might find in spacetrack.org, which anybody can go into and, and download. So I'd like to ask you about uh, what information um, you're planning to give to commerce, uh, how you're going to give it to them, and what kind of data rights come with that? Is there Are there entailments that are going to prohibit them from making uh, multilateral connections and doing things? So uh, I'd like you to start, and then we'll We'll pick up uh, with Diane on the other side. Jeff, over to you. Well, uh, all great stuff, Mark. And I would say first and foremost that nothing's going over the transom in the middle of the night. Um, this is a partnership that's being formed, uh, shoulder to shoulder, back to back, however you want to call it. This is an interagency partnership. I, I think it was Leon Panetta that I heard say it uh, uh, out, out at the um, the Reagan Library uh, in Simi Valley, California, 
that there is no problem that we face right now that can be solved by a single member of the U.S. Sender Agency. So taking that as a fact, or assuming that as a fact, we're working shoulder to shoulder with one another, again, back to back. So the idea is, though, that as a uh, inter, you know, interconnected unit, we're going to have different areas of focus, which is fine. Um, they're going to focus on civil commercial. I'm going to pivot a little bit, yet still be connected. So less shoulder to shoulder and more back to back on those security issues, those security and defense issues of the four S's, sustain, safe, secure, and ultimately stable or sustainable. So, um, you know, I look at Ryan, hey man, you're my stability guy. You're the, you're the diplomat. I need you to work that piece, you know? And when it comes to the safety, I look at Steph and Diane. I need you guys to work that piece. I'll do the secure piece. Um, and ultimately together we, we provide the pillars that uh, make uh, space sustainable for future generations. A lot of the details are still being worked out, but our objective is to give commerce everything they need to be successful without jeopardizing national security. Now, that sounds like an old answer, but you don't have to go any further than spacetrack.org to see that we are publishing information on more stuff than we ever have. You won't find a DOD owned and operated object that doesn't have a TLE out on it. As I speak, uh, Reentry re and deorbit information is being updated in the SATCAT spreadsheet, which, oh, by the way, to the previous conversation, is not the U.S. registry of objects. And frankly, I have to dispel that myth all the time. A little bit about the previous topic that I didn't chime in on is there's a lot of concern there. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I've never played one on TV. But as soon as you start putting stuff in that registry, it's got legal, legal implications. So I'm more than happy to allow Ryan and Steph to deal with those thorny patches. But that's the objective. Um, the key, though, and I've said this when we were working more closely, Steph's going to go, oh, God, Jeff's going to say um, uh, mutually supportive. Um, that's really what we're complementary and mutually supportive. That's what we're looking to get at here is we're not looking to have commerce spend the scarce dollars that they do have to duplicate or replicate anything we have. And it's not the DOD's space surveillance network. It's the U.S. government, the U.S. taxpayers' space surveillance network. So that's, that's the path that we're on. Would we like to see them get more money? Sure. I've been pushing that for years. So I see Diane raising her hand. I'm going to shut up now and let her take the mic. Well, <laughs> so I, I, just want to, I just want to reiterate a little bit on, on uh, something that Jeff was saying, that, that this isn't going over the transom in the middle of the night. Not at all. And not only are we working shoulder to shoulder, but Jeff and I know each other way too well at this point because we've been on so many calls on a weekly basis, sometimes, you know, two, three times during a week because we've been working on an MOU that really formalizes that that collaboration and that partnership and deals with a lot of these activities. So I, I, it, this is... Uh, there, there's an awareness of the fact that that uh, Leon Panetta was a very wise man when he made that observation. And and when I mentioned earlier that the demonstrations uh, are really where a lot of the goodness lies, uh, well, some of those, some of our performance objectives tie right into those demonstrations and tie right into this question. And they have to do with not just establishing the cloud the, with the contract and utilities and the integrator, but but also transitioning those basic data sets from spacetrack.org um, and that opens a whole host of other things that come with it because how do you make that usable and I think that's part of your your question mark is is how do we make that that information more usable than it is um, so I'll, I'll stop there but I, I, I do want people to understand that it's this is not just an uh, an idle conversation on a, on a panel but this is something that's part of our boots on the ground weekly and sometimes daily reality yeah so I want to I want to touch back on something Jeff said uh, uh, hearkening about security and, and let's set our clocks to the, you know, to several years ago when uh, Doug Lavero was speaking, making a keynote speak at, a, at an FAA AST industry day. Um, and he talked about space safety data and transforming, uh, taking space safety data from, from the Air Force 
and giving it to the AST and probably now we would say the uh, Department of Commerce Office of Space Commerce. Uh, but we noticed that a lot of um, a lot of SSN data begins either begins life classified because from the classified sensor or it exists on a classified network or circuit. Um, getting data out of a classified network or circuit into an unclassified system um, can be uh, problematic, not impossible, but problematic. Uh, we also noticed that NASA CARA uh, manages to get a lot of uh, important information, um, uh, SP vectors and that sort of thing on unclassified objects uh, via a sneaker net. I'm wondering if if people have a way of, uh, is, is, is commerce's first role going to be uh, getting a copy of what CARA gets or are there plans for uh, some other mechanism, some maybe more permanent and, and uh, uh, automatic kind of mechanism. So I'll let whoever wants to jump in there, jump in, over. I'll go ahead and simply say that not all unclassified information is public information. So uh, we share a tremendous, I will tell you that the vast lion's share of the information on the secret network is unclassified. And we work the sharing of that information on request with our SSA sharing agreement holders. Why do we have SSA sharing agreement and we don't just throw it all out on the internet? Well, we have to be able to have something that allows us to service customer needs. So the agreement does that for us. Um, we can't be thing, all things, all people, all of the time. We're just not, even the big fat boy on the block, the DOD isn't resource for that. So, um, that's a whole part of what what Diane and I are talking out uh, talking about with our, our with our interagency MOU is to identify those data sets um, to share those got those sets with commerce because in in the beginning I would think if they don't want to repeat the sins of the past that we've continually repeated with this whole thing in DoD they're going to have to be independent they're going to have to have an environment to innovate in uh, an environment that I'd like to harvest innovation from frankly so. That's you know we're going to give them what they ask for, but they're in, they're in the leading role there. Um, so I don't know if that helps answer the question, but but I think it it it's to try to dispel a misnomer out there that everything we have has a secret tagged slapped on it because we're lazy, and that couldn't be furthest from the truth. Does it certain information when it's not correlated at the site get a secret tag on it? Yes, we have very tight tolerances at the sensors. Are those sense uh, tolerances a little more uh, generous when it gets to um, the system that the 18th Space Control Squadron uses? Yes, it does. So a lot of the times we have stuff that was kind of ambiguous at the sites tagged as secret, and then it gets re-tagged as unclassified. So, um, but again, there's also a lot of uh, dangers uh, associated with sharing everything just because you can. And that's the balance between the need to share and the need to protect um, and it's not just the U.S., it's our allies and other partners um, that have a stake in um, not losing uh, their space capabilities should, God forbid, um, shenanigans start there. So th th there's a whole bunch of things to balance, but um, I hope that answers a little bit. Diane, Steph, Brian, want to jump in? One thing I will add is that um, there are a lot of challenges and that's why it's taking so long on this MOU. Um, I remember a long time ago when <laughs> a bunch of us were in Paris for the spring meetings and you all, all of you astrodynamicist types and, and related disciplines tried to explain to me, the, the lawyer, the difference between complex and complicated. and. And I would say if I, that, that there are both complex and complicated issues in bringing over data sets from spacetrack.org. Um, I think that we're looking more at the ones that are complicated, where you pull a thread, they look really 
difficult and awful, but they're not as embedded. So they're easier to pull over. And, and I think that, you know, we, this is why programmatic uh, phased approaches are often very sensible in, in a situation like this, because we start with something that's, that's a little easier, even though it's very complicated, and we don't have to bite the whole thing off at once. We're also not limited to the information and the data that comes to us from the space track dot org and from and and from DOD and I think that's another thing that really will is helping us as we plan these demos because there are so many diverse data sets which will help us as we wrestle with some of these um, sticky wicket problems thank you um Okay, I'm going to change gears here a little bit. I want to go back to Steph uh, to hearken on some things that you said, Steph, and uh, and some um, and some things from previous panels, and actually, frankly, from previous editions of this particular conference, when we've talked about national airspace launching into the national airspace, disruption of civil aviation, um, and uh, and the before time when we used to take business trips. I recall uh, we'd get on an airplane and, and fly somewhere, and and that was considered fun or maybe it wasn't but uh so we've got a situation that's different now you, you're trying to launch and you've got to deal you've got to dodge airplanes uh or the airplanes have to keep out of your way right. and they don't necessarily like to do that uh because they want to get to their destination on time and you've got all these proliferated leo constellations that are building up um with more and more objects creating shells uh Steph, that's got to make your job difficult. Well, how's how's that going? Um, could you could you okay, fill well, us in on that? You, you kind of mix two things, but I'll get them both. So, yeah. um, the, the first one is is launching through the national aerospace, uh, which is becoming more difficult just because of the sheer number of launches. And so, as we progress, and there are a few things that are also making it a little more challenging, like uh, launching uh, from inland sites for commercial space tourism and such. And so. When you build a spaceport, you want to build it someplace where they're, you know, you're far away from people. Um, but your first area is I need no people. But but later you have to figure out well what's flying over me. And so we've seen a lot of issues with that. We're working very hard in the commercial space office with the air traffic organization to try to minimize the impacts um, between you know commercial space operations and commercial aviation operations. Bluntly. I would argue that we highlight this and it's almost like a first world problem because the, the real amount of airspace that is impacted is, is not as much as, as you might think. I mean, on a given day, at a given time, it's significant. But when you look at the large picture of all the national airspace and you figure out how much percentage of airspace is used by launch on, on any given day, and then and per so it's it's not a lot. But that said, airlines operate on the margins. They every little little thing. I mean, why do we get a plastic fork or no fork now or um, or any of that? I mean, they operate on a shoestring of a lot of things. So it impacts them. So that's what one of the things that's nice about the transportation department is we're used to taking disparate methods of transportation, cars and trains, and deciding how they cross. And so that all works for us. So um, it's not really an, an issue. Now, you mentioned the mega constellations and launching into those shells. That is a mega constellations, right. but no, there we go. Large constellation, mega constellation, whichever way you want to work it. This is a whole new phenomenon for us because while space is big, the initial rules for a new launch operator might be um, you, you have to avoid anybody's payload by 25 kilometers. And that was the Air Force standard for the last 20 years. Well, guess what? If you want to go to 550 kilometers, you can because you will always be, you will always pass within 25 kilometers of an iridium or um, a, a planet or a flock or a star link just a large number of objects. And so we have to find a new way to deal with these orbital shells. Um, there was a question, and, and I'll go right to it. Somebody said, what's the carrying capacity of these orbits? And that's the bottom line. And we haven't gotten there yet. We haven't been able to answer that because is it the carrying capacity limited by the collisions? And we've seen through FCC documents that that's what some 
operators want to go off of. They just want to go off of what's an actual collision. And then we've also seen some say that the limiting is conjunctions, making me move. Um, so this, uh, it's just a lot of work, a lot of new science that needs to be made in these areas. Um, and so I guess it's, it's interesting times that we live in. Okay, thank you, Steph. Uh, in the remaining moments, uh, I've got a, a final question for Ryan. Um, UN Copuis uh, has been a, a point of discussion for, for a number of us that uh, attend this. Uh, I didn't go last April because, uh, because I went skiing after 16 in a row, and that was fun. Uh, I think Mark Mulholland was there. Um, I noticed this year it's, it's been delayed, obviously, because of the pandemic. Uh, can you can you give us a brief update on what's going to happen and what's happening with LTS 2.0 or uh, further discussions on the on future guidelines and that kind of thing? Ryan, please. Uh, well, so what I can say is that so the STSC Scientific and Technical Subcommittee has been moved to April now. Um, the format is still being figured out, uh, and so the LTS 2.0 working group, uh, you know, met informally last year for the first time and. It's still in its early stages of trying to figure out, you know, the bureau and the work plan and all that. So that is still certainly a work in progress. And, you know, I think it's hard, especially in this virtual environment, to really kind of have those substantive discussions. So, you know, we're hoping that we can do more of that in the coming months in April. And, and maybe, you know, when, when full copious is, maybe there will be more optimistic chances to travel. We're not really too sure yet. Um, but all of that is still very much in the early phases. So, so we're hoping we can make more gains on that in the near future. Well, thank you. I see we're out of time. I'm delivering this back to the organizers. I uh, want to thank everybody on the panel. A wonderful discussion. I would remind the panelists that there may be lurking questions in the Q&A. Uh, please, during the break and afterwards, uh, search out questions or questions you want to answer and please answer them. Uh, but again, thank you, everybody. And I turn it back to Mariba. Mariba, over to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank of all of our panelists. It was really awesome. Um, you know, certainly I had a bunch of questions, but uh, I'm just here as a servant. Um, so, so I'm glad to see that a uh, lot of energy and a lot of lot of questions, and everybody did a, a really really great job. So we're gonna take a break because uh, breaks are good, and we're gonna convene in nine minutes, where I will be moderating a Q and A. Uh, session for lifetime, ADR, disposal, demise, that sort of stuff. Should be really, really interesting. So nine minutes from now, uh, I will meet you here. Thank you so much. <laughs>